Welcome to First. I'm Shirley Min along with Michelle Polston and Mark Eichmann. Look to the skies if you want to know what the new growth business will be for this decade. A drone school starting up in Delaware hoping to capture that market. The growth in languages as a key to the future is well documented. Spanish immersion has been around the longest. The Delaware Education Desk provides an update. And Delaware's Attorney General has updates on those who battle opioid addiction, offshore oil drilling, and perhaps his future. First, your public media news magazine starts now. drones were primarily used for military purposes. But as technology advances, the civilian world is discovering new applications for the unmanned aircraft in what's predicted to become a multi-billion dollar industry. Not surprisingly, we're seeing more drone schools pop up. And we take a look at one of them right here in Wilmington in this week's First Look. With the popularity of drones taking off, so too are the money-making opportunities, it seems. Every industry is going to be impacted or could be impacted by the use of drones. Theo Nix sees the writing on the wall, which is why the lawyer by trade founded Drone Workforce Solutions, or DWS. With a $59,000 Delaware Department of Labor grant, Nix developed a 10-week, 70-hour curriculum combining classroom work with hands-on flying time for 12 students, tuition free. We train people who are interested in getting into drone technology by teaching them how to fly drones, um, how to pass the uh, Federal Aviation Administration exam, how to edit the data that they get, and how to build a drone. There are other drone schools in Delaware and plenty of online courses to choose from. But Nick says what separates DWS from the rest is it's also an employment agency. We hire drone operators from around the country. We validate the information that they are FAA certified, that they have their licenses, what kind of drones they fly, uh, where are they in the country. And when we have jobs from employers, we can then send that information to the drone operators and ask them what, if they're interested in the job, here's how much you're pay they're paying, this is what's required, who's interested. Gabe Cruz is a graduate of DWS's inaugural class. I saw opportunity, I didn't hesitate. I was like, look, it's a new industry that's pretty much untouched territory in Delaware. So I was like, hey, why not? FAA certified, Cruz is ready to work. FAA certification is required if you want to make money piloting a drone. This is definitely a career worthy. Um, anybody could uh, make a full time career out of this. The sky's the limit. So I can do anything from inspections. I can do agricultural. I can do, you know, the typical cinematography as well, where I can fly in the sky, do some editing. Um, editing is going to be a really big skill to have when it comes to, you know, aerial drone videography. And apparently, there's a lot of money to be made around the world. Investment bank Goldman Sachs forecasts drones to grow to a $100 billion industry by 2020 worldwide. Demand from the military is projected to account for $70 billion. Consumers like you and me are expected to spend a total of $17 billion buying drones. And businesses and local governments account for the remaining $13 billion. That $13 billion is what Nix is going after. So right now we're targeting the utility companies. Agriculture is huge. We can do what's called precision intervention and really pinpoint for farmers where their issue is um, in the field. Instead of spraying the whole thousand acres, for example, we can show a farmer where the issue is in his field and then they can spray just that area, saving them millions of dollars over a period of time. Real estate is also a growing drone market. A national survey shows while the majority of realtors don't use drones now, 18 percent said they plan to in the future. And that means dollar signs for FAA commercial drone pilots. You're allowed to go up to 400 feet. That plane is probably a couple thousand feet. Ray Bakta is not affiliated with DWS, but has been flying drones for a few years now. He works at Delaware Digital Video Factory in Fairfax and was FAA certified last year. Bakta says being able to get aerial shots adds a lot to his video production work. 
it's an emerging market. Definitely a lot of potential out there. It's hard to put a number on it, I would say, but it's definitely fun to watch and fun to be involved in because there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff coming on the horizon. And, and, and then you also have like Amazon and all these places that UPS that want to start delivering with drones. And, and that's a whole nother industry in itself. But 10, 20 years from now, we may have drones flying all over the place. When you think about it, there are so many applications for drones. Law enforcement can use them instead of helicopters for search and rescue. Insurance companies could use them to survey storm damage, and the list goes on. And Nick says most drone operators, Mark, can earn a six-figure salary. So does anybody who flies a drone have to be certified with the FAA? No, not if you're just a hobbyist flying drones for fun. But if you want to get paid, then you do need to have that certification. You know, the FAA started realizing with so many people getting drones because they were getting so popular, they needed to sort of develop and regulate them and develop some rules. So um, every state is different, but there are some universal rules across the state lines, like you don't fly over people, you don't fly over cars, just because, you know, they could drop out of the sky and really hurt somebody. <laughs> Seems like pretty common sense right. rules. So if the school is tuition free, how does drone work for solutions? Uh how do they how do they survive? How do they right. make their money? So the inaugural class didn't have to pay tuition because of the Department of Labor grant. You know, the Department of Labor um, awards this grant every year to companies that do workforce development and sort of meet employer needs. Going forward, though, without that funding, the tuition for the class will be six thousand dollars. So when is the next uh, class? When's the signups? Nix is planning a second class in both Wilmington and South Jersey in the spring. Ahead of that, though, he is setting up some information sessions that are about an hour long, and you can email him through his website to find out more about when those sessions are going to be at DroneWorkforceSolutions.com. All right, thanks so much, Shirley. You can read more at whyy.org slash news. Coming up on first, Spanish is an everyday experience in some Delaware schools. That doesn't mean it is the first language for these kids. And first experience this week is the artistry of Stephen Tannis. He's gone from the classroom to the everyday art world. We'll show you later on first. Delaware Attorney General Matt Den filed a lawsuit against drug companies, distributors, and two drugstore chains for their role in Delaware's epidemic of opioid overdose deaths. He's also joined an effort by attorneys general in 22 other states to stop the rollback of net neutrality rules. He joins us now as this week's first person. Matt, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, so uh, last year you called the epidemic of opioid addiction in Delaware a human tragedy. You called it a, a disaster for the criminal justice system. Uh, now you filed a lawsuit against uh, uh, the makers of, of some of these drugs and distributors. Uh, take us through kind of that decision, what the goal is with, with that tactic. Sure. Uh, well, as you mentioned, this has been a, an ongoing priority for us on, on the law enforcement front in terms of trying to deal with the uh, with the, the dealing aspect. Uh, very much on the treatment front, one of the points that that I've been trying to make over the last three years is that the you know the law enforcement portion is critical, but but certainly not the the long term solution, and that we need to deal with the demand side. So we've been very involved in trying to get the number of opioid prescriptions down, uh, trying to get treatment options expanded for Delawareans. So those are all those have all been priorities. All of those things are incredibly costly. There's the human tragedy part of it that, that you mentioned, which is first and foremost, but that there's also a real uh, crushing economic cost to the state uh, in terms of health care costs, law enforcement costs that's imposed by this opioid epidemic. And this lawsuit that you mentioned that we filed alleges that, that the companies that have had a, a lot to do with the, the, the existence of this epidemic, manufacturers, uh, distributors, dispensers, that they ought to help the state offset that cost. So uh, we've filed the suit. It's, uh, it's against a number of major national corporations and it will probably take some time to resolve, uh, but we thought that it was important to try to ensure that, that they help the state bear the cost of, of dealing with this. Uh, and last fall you outlined uh, a, a number of steps that you wanted the state to spend, uh, some four million dollars to, like you mentioned, Im improve treatment space, uh, make more space available. How has the things that you laid out, I think in September, how has it played out? Is it, are, are we doing it? Well, it, the legislature's back now, and so we are, we're hopeful that they're going to take up that suggestion and, and implement it. Our suggestion was that the state every year puts millions of dollars, usually about $10 million a year, into economic development, into its strategic fund that it uses to incentivize businesses to come here and stay here. And our proposal is, let's take $4 million of that money in this upcoming fiscal year and use it specifically to try to incentivize people to create new treatment facilities in Delaware, because there is a real 
uh, gap in terms of long-term treatment for people who have addiction issues. Our, we have a, a number of detox facilities, but those are only for a very limited number of days and offer a very limited range of treatment. And many people, maybe most people uh, who are, are caught up in this addiction crisis, require a lot more than seven to ten days of intensive treatment. And we just don't have the facilities in Delaware right now adequate to, to meet that need. Uh, so our proposal is let's, let's use some of this economic development money to try to, to generate some more of those facilities, which will also create jobs and will also uh, be economic activity generators but in an area that we really need so we're we're hopeful and optimistic that the legislature as it makes its way through the end of June implementing next year's budget will take up that suggestion uh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about another possible lawsuit you sent a letter to uh, the Secretary of the Interior uh, threatening uh, threatening to, to sue over the uh, offshore uh, plans to drill to open up Delaware's uh, coastal area to offshore drilling uh, kind of take us through through your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, the, the crux of our letter was that the Interior Department uh, put out some proposed rules about offshore drilling and then almost immediately after putting out those rules uh, exempted the state of Florida from them. Uh, and our point was that the, the basis on which Florida was exempted applies equally to Delaware. All the concerns that were listed for, for exempting Florida are just as much, if not more, concerns for Delaware. Our coastal area is critical to our economy, and offshore drilling in that area uh, would, would have potentially devastating effects on our economy and the ecology there. So, There's a lot of other states that have, that have made similar arguments. Uh, to, to yours and to Governor Carney's, uh, and and you've also uh, sort of joined a lot of other states in in an argument against uh, rollback of net neutrality rules. So uh, talk about that. Yeah, and there and obviously a very different issue from from offshore drilling. Right. Uh, but the the same general legal basis, which is that federal agencies, FCC, Interior Department, have to act in a, in a rational way. Their actions have to be based on their federal statutory authorization. Uh, they can't act in an arbitrary and capricious way. And, and our argument with respect to the FCC's rollback of net neutrality is that they are, uh, they're not allowed to do it the way that they did, that the statute uh, doesn't allow for them to treat internet service providers in, in the way that their rule purports to, to do that. So uh, as you mentioned, there are, there are uh, I think, about two dozen other uh, state attorneys general, and collectively we filed a legal challenge and that actually has been filed. The, the, the uh, issue with offshore drilling is still in the uh, discussion stage. There's actually a pending legal appeal of the FCC rule, and uh, we're going to be asking a federal court to determine that the FCC essentially wasn't allowed to do what it did. Uh, there is an election for attorney general this coming November, but voters, so won't, I hear. voters won't see Matt Den's name uh, on the ballot. Talk about your decision uh, not to run for re-election. Sure. Well, I, I, you know, every time I've run for office, there's sort of a key point when you have to decide, do I want to do this again? And that's a discussion that I've had with my family multiple times. This, at the end of this year, I'll have been in statewide elective office for 14 years. Uh, and that's, that's a long time. Uh, and my, my boys were born uh, five days before I got sworn into my first statewide office. So this is all they've ever known. Right. Uh, and they're 13 now. They just turned 13 about uh, two weeks ago. And it, it just seemed like it was time. There's five more years uh, that they're going to be around the house, and then they probably won't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> uh, so it just seemed like it was a, a good time uh, for me to, to uh, do something else for, for a while. Uh, and also, we were just talking about uh, some of these issues that involving children. Uh, that's something that is a, a major priority for me. It was before I was attorney general and it has remained so and one of the challenges of uh, being the attorney general is that it's a huge responsibility just the management of the office and I, and I think we do a good job managing it but it's a it's a 400 person operation it's one of only three attorney general offices in the country that actually has criminal enforcement jurisdiction right. most states have district attorneys states attorneys we don't have that so we do everything that DAs and other states do plus everything else that their AGs do. And, right. and doing all that well on a daily basis doesn't allow for a lot of time to, to work on some of those other issues affecting kids. So uh, that was also part of what I was looking at is going forward, what can I do that's going to allow me to try to spend some more time on those other issues. So I sense in your answer uh, some time off, uh, maybe take a break. You see yourself maybe in five years when, when the kids are 18, 19, uh, jumping back into to politics in some form? 
Uh, or not. I mean, if it turns out that I'm getting things done uh, for the state in the, on the private side, I might, I might continue doing that. Uh, you used the term time off, and in case my wife is watching this broadcast, <laughs> I wish to make clear that she has You're informed me that there will be no time off. No chip uh, eating on the couch. We still have a, a mortgage to pay in January right. of, uh, of 2019. All right, yep. Matt Den, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. He is Delaware's Attorney General, Matt Den, our first person this week. Thanks for your time. Good luck. Thank you. Earlier this month on FIRST, we featured Delaware's six-year-old Chinese immersion program, which attracts 1,000 elementary school students, but that's only a fraction of the young kids in kindergarten through fifth grade learning another language. Here with more is Delaware education reporter Chris Barish. Hi, Chris. Hi, Nikki. In our second installment about immersion, we look at how learning Spanish and English is benefiting thousands of young children. At Lewis Elementary School in Wilmington, fifth graders Rebecca Wright and Michaela Albino can converse in both Spanish and English. La señora Hannigan era muy mal. ¿Qué es el nombre del perro? El nombre del perro es um, Sandy. The girls are among the growing number of participants in one of Delaware's biggest education experiments in recent years. Intensive learning in two languages, starting in kindergarten. Jeffrey, vamos Jeffrey. Begun six years ago under then-Governor Jack Markell, today about 4,000 K-5 through students learn in both Spanish and English. Muy bien. Muy bien, Jeffrey. Another 1,000 do so in Chinese. Ya la Spanish immersion is thriving in 26 elementary schools, plus two Newcastle County charters. Arregló. ¿Te gusta? Es un verbo arregló. Muy bien. Anytime I, I talk to our parents, uh, prospective parents who come in, um, First thing I say is, you know, this is, this is giving your child a gift. To be able to have students who by the end of their academic career are bilingual, uh, biliterate, and bicultural, and, and have a sense and appreciation for language, the power that it has, um, you know, the, the cultural capital that it, that it carries, and the advantages that it has for the, the workforce. At the traditional schools, students spend half the day in each language. The charters, Las Americas Aspira and Antonio Alonso do one full day in Spanish and the next in English. Now in its sixth year at a sparkling former sports training warehouse near Newark, Aspira has expanded to middle school. Principal Margie lopez Wait said Aspira was started to help Delaware's Latino population become fluent in English. But ultimately what we were able to create was a school that was attractive to not only Hispanic families, but also non-Hispanic families that really saw a value in their children being bilingual and biliterate. In this day and age, regardless of what career path they pursue, it's going to be an asset. Lopez Waite believes dual language learning is critical in American society today. We want to get to the point where when somebody goes into the emergency room, they go see a doctor, they go into the pharmacy, they go into a school, um, they go into the supermarket. Each one of those touch points in our community, um, it would be ideal to be able to have somebody who's bilingual to make that individual feel welcome. The dual language classrooms work because teachers support each other and so do the kids. When I see them in third grade, by that time they have many of their basics down, their alphabet, their numbers, and they can, they can take content and connect it across languages. Ocho, muy bien. We just got a brand new student to our school who's from Puerto Rico and his English is limited, so it's very interested to see those connections where they're practicing their Spanish with him and he's learning his English along with them, so that's great to see. Sanaya Moore, an Espira sixth grader, makes a daily 70 mile round trip from her home in Smyrna. It was a little hard, but I kind of got used to it. By what, first grade or by second grade? Or? By second grade. Taking classes in two languages is normal to Moore now, as she'll tell you in her second tongue. Es importante a hablar en español ahora porque es muy difícil a State officials say the immersion program has exceeded expectations and they anticipate its continued growth. In fifth grade, being able to read Harry Potter in English and in Spanish and have discussions and have this fluidity between languages is just 
it sells by itself. You see parents like when they do open houses on walk tours of the buildings and they see this, like who would not want that for their kid? Mike Pesci, who has three children at Aspira, couldn't agree more. His wife Sarah is an avid volunteer, helping with outdoor gardens and other duties. So as much as our kids are learning Spanish because they hear it every other day, they are also picking up on cultural cues and they're going to be better adults, uh, more compassionate adults, um, more well-rounded adults because they have friends that are from every kind of family situation, every kind of cultural situation that you could imagine. As you see, the Immersion Program is providing a dual language foundation that will benefit Delaware in so many ways, now and in the future. As usual, another informative and illuminating piece, Chris. Uh, tell me, I was really intrigued by the fact that Espirita seems to be helping more English-speaking students learn Spanish. Well, today about 70% of the kids are native English speaker speakers, which is the opposite of what they expected. And when parents go to visit Espirita, they see a modern, brightly colored interior that gives off a cheery vibe that, you know, you really can't help but feel. And, uh, you know, Spanish is also so ingrained in American society today, and parents want to get their kids prepared. And the program seems to keep growing. Yeah, it certainly does. This year, more than one in six Delaware kindergartners are enrolled in Spanish immersion. And a lot more schools want to start programs. Well, there you have it. Thanks so much, Chris. For those of you at home, you can see more of Chris's education stories at whyy.org slash news. In Governor Carney's State of the State address last week, he reiterated his thought that state spending can't be built around one-time revenue infusions. Translation, if you want to build a budget that works, you have to find a sustainable source of money. This week, the governor outlined his spending priorities. Carney's operating budget stands at $4.25 billion. That's a 3.5% increase in spending over last year. The proposed capital budget of $677 million to fund construction and other projects is about $100 million more than last year. The budget doesn't include any new taxes or fees. It calls for using a projected $100 million surplus in the current fiscal year to fund one-time items like infrastructure and economic development efforts. The budget plan also includes a $1,000 raise for state employees. In education, the budget plan calls for an extra $3.8 million to fund the early childhood education program called STARS. Carney also wants $6 million to fund opportunity grants for high poverty schools. He also wants a 2% pay raise for public school educators. In order to help schools in Wilmington, Carney is targeting $1.5 million for school-based wellness centers and professional development for teachers in five Christina District schools. He's also earmarked $15 million to help modernize two Wilmington schools in the district, pending an agreement to consolidate some Christina schools. You can read our coverage of the Kearney administration spending plan on whyy.org slash news. Stay with WHYY on the radio at 90.9 here on First or online to see how this year's budget is put together in the first state. Remember, a vote for a new budget is due by June 30th. Last year, that didn't happen. We'll be watching this year. Steve Tannis has been an artist and educator for over four decades. The professor emeritus at the University of Delaware taught both drawing and painting at the school for nearly 30 years. Now retired, he is still going strong. We visited with him in his art and studio where he is busy working on his latest painting. It's our first experience this week. I started painting when I was about 13 years old. My sister uh, encouraged me because, you know, I like to draw. I think most kids like to draw, but I really like to draw to the detriment of my studies and everything. And uh, so I took a class and uh, I really liked it. I, I, it was quite a natural uh, medium for me. I jump around between still life and the figure. From time to time, I'd be inspired. I have a drawing here of my brother who was wounded in Vietnam badly. So when I did that drawing, I found a great deal of satisfaction from just to express the fact that I was upset, I guess. 
I love still life because it, it's, it's a world that I create through my own observation and technique and energy. I can offer uh, something just to a viewer that it maybe will move them. You know, they'll get the same experience that I do. I love that that beginning. I can tell almost within a couple of days whether I have a painting that's worth doing. I love that part and I love a few parts in between where I succeed at, at an accidental level. Like, you know, I'll be trying to paint something in it with a, a, a couple of gestures, you know, it works out. You know, it's a, it's a, a good description and yet it's got the energy of, of the paint itself. You know, in between there's just a lot of work, not a grind but it's, it's work. I feel like maybe there's somebody I could hire to do this. <laughs> but, in, in that, but then I'd, I'd uh, miss out on the possibility of luck, you know, getting those lucky uh, brush strokes. Yeah, I do a lot of fights, uh, like there's a, a painting on the wall there. The context is, is very uh, ambiguous. Now it's more specific. This new painting is something, uh, I saw some film of a Mardi Gras celebration and towards the end of the evening, it was getting out of hand. Cops were come through with horses and it just was so dramatic. I think the drama of uh, violence that's about to occur, I think it's a worthy painting idea. I don't like the confrontation, but I'm, I'm engaged by it. I really am fascinated by it. I like painting. I, I think I still have a lot of paintings to make. You know, there's something just very satisfying about that. To, to make your observations uh, manifest, you know, on a canvas, it's, uh, uh, and to get a response from it. Painting has, a, a, it can offer a, an incredible engaging beauty. It can capture the essence of a, a particular problem, whether it's race or anarchy or just keeping the peace. I think painting still has uh, possibilities. Steve hopes to have a show soon featuring his latest painting. You can learn more about Steve and his work when you visit him on the web at stephentannis.com. Next week on First, we have Governor John Carney here in our first studio. He'll go through his budget, or at least what he hopes his budget will be. It's also the one-year mark of that prison uprising at the Vaughan Correctional Center, so we'll have lots to talk about. And before we go, I wanted you to clarify one thing for me. You know, we had a mention in our first facts about how Delaware stands to lose money if the Eagles win the Super Bowl. Right. You reported that story online earlier this week, as well as for FM and on the, ra on the radio. Explain for me how that works. So more people in Delaware, uh, which is the only place you can legally sports bet, uh, at least on the East Coast, more people put money on the Eagles than any other team. Okay. The odds opened at 26 to 1 at the beginning of the season that the Eagles would win the Super Bowl. It's now down to 6 to 1 odds that they'll win the Super Bowl. So all those people who bet with those really good odds at the beginning of the season when we didn't know what was going to happen uh, got pretty good odds. So right. the state stands to lose $350,000 if the Eagles win the Super Bowl. So right. while lottery officials aren't officially rooting for any one team, <laughs> uh, I think a lot of them will be wearing green at the office uh, in, the, in the next week. Okay, well, thanks so much, Mark. I'm going to guess that if the state loses money on the sports bet, it'll be made up with all the goodwill brought about with an Eagles Super Bowl victory. Awesome. That is first for this week for Shirley Min, Mark Eichmann, and Chris Barish. I'm Nichelle Polson. Have a great week.